Right. Um, we're, uh, we're starting back again, and I know that um, the breakout groups were really enjoyable and that people had lots to say and lots of listening. And therefore, what we're going to do now is I'm going to hand back to Will. He's going to introduce three videos. We're going to see those. Then we're going to go back and not follow instructions in the same way as people didn't follow instructions <laughs> the first time they went into breakout groups. Will. Thank you. Okay, so um, we had five policies. We've talked about two of them. It's always tricky when you've got a group of five to break them into individual ones. So some of these will answer back some of the questions that were certainly raised in my group. So the third of our five pillars is to commit to community-led economic, social and development plans that become the basis of levelling up bids, but also future public sector investment. Um, in our breakout group, there were questions of like, well, how do we know where to spend it and how to spend it? Well, if you watch this video now um, from Mark and Dawn, you'll get a sense as to how these economic plans might be useful. Hi, I'm Mark Gale from Gloucestershire Gateway Trust. And I'm here with Dawn Barnes from the Venture White City, who's also the secretary of the Matson Robbins Wood and White City Community Partnership, who've created the Power of Three Community Economic Plan. So Dawn, tell us a little bit about how that plan came about. So the Matson Robbins Wood and White City Community Partnership are a really strong partnership. And the aim of that partnership is to make sure that local people have the chance to have their voices heard and also to sit, kind of sit across all the organisations that work in our ward to provide a kind of collective voice for them, if you like. So for us, it was about making sure that, A, our residents in our communities could have their voices heard and really kind of have an input into life in their community and what their kind of aspirations are for that. And also to make sure that the organisations in the partnership have a kind of central point of connection that is kind of both practical and strategic for them. Yeah, and the partnership's really important and the plan has had a really big impact locally and with larger external organisations. What do you think about that and how has that happened? I think what it's done for us is showing people that we're a really well-organised community that has aspirations for what it wants to achieve and that is brought together in a plan that actually says, we know what the issues are in our community, mm. we know how we want to address some of those issues some things we can do for ourselves, and there's a lot we can do for ourselves, but where we need help, this is what we would like from partners and other people. So it really is a kind of structured plan that sets all of that out. So um, for us, it kind of is mapping out where the partnership wants to kind of progress over the next couple of years. And we know from the 2008 financial crash that our communities came out worse than most other communities in the county and nationally, in fact. What difference do you think the community plan can make uh, going forward to make sure that doesn't happen again in the current crisis? I think it's really important. Communities like ours get um, kind of a bit of bad press, if you like. We're, we're kind of called the deprived communities and nobody kind of really expects a plan like we've produced from communities like ours. And, and that's just kind of, I think, when we produce this plan and we say, actually, we've got a plan here that talks about what residents want, um, it talks about what issues are really important to them, how they want to address those issues and how, you know, the solutions we've got to that and the creative solutions we've got to that. People don't expect that from us. So when we come to them with that plan, they're thinking, hang on a minute, these guys are really organised. They've got a plan here. We can work with them on that plan because we're not starting from scratch. We don't have to do lots of consultation or lots of that kind of groundwork, if you like. That groundwork has already been done. So what that plan has given us is a kind of a step up the ladder, if you like, to say to partners, public bodies or whoever that might be, here's our plan. Let's work together on how you can help us achieve some of the things that we want to do with our plan. So long-term investment in the communities meant the communities in a place to create a long-term future. Absolutely, absolutely. I think for us, it's about, it's kind of switching it around a bit. Instead of people saying to us, well, this is what we're going to come to your community to do and just accept it and, and be grateful for that. Actually, we flip that on our head and we're saying, actually, we're telling you, this is what we want to do as a community. These are our aims. These are our aspirations. These are our challenges. And this is how we want you to work with us and, and not the other way around. So for us, that's really powerful, actually. And that's mm. making kind of people think differently about our community. And actually, it's really done um, great things for our relationships with, with people already. And we're already beginning to see gains in that 
where we're sitting around different tables and kind of talking to people that we wouldn't have had conversations with before, but the plan has meant that they're kind of viewing us differently, if you like. So we're asking people to think differently. And what do you think are the essential ingredients for a community plan? I think community plans are not easy. It's taken us a long time to write this plan. You have to make sure that everybody in your community is invested in that plan. And you have to take the time to make sure that everyone's included in that plan. And that's not an easy process. Um, so you've got to give the plan the time it deserves to make it a really relevant plan because otherwise it ends up with just a, you know ideas from a certain group of people. That's not what the plan's about. The whole plan is about making sure the community are invested in that and the partners are invested in that plan so that it's a, a plan for the whole community. But it's definitely something else, uh, something that other communities can do. Absolutely, I would recommend it. What it's given us as a community is a focus. So yes, of course, we're all organisations and community groups working in our own little ways across our ward, but collectively it's shown us that we have so much more power and so much more influence when we come together and sit under that plan. Um, it's really given us a, a, different, um, a different outlook on things. How can uh, leaders in the public sector, in councils and health organisations and social landlords help communities create these essential community plans? I think it's really important that um, they create time to listen to communities because at the end of the day, we're the people that live in those communities. So, so we, know, we know our communities inside out. So it's, they need to listen to us and um, create a time and a space that they can do that. We don't often get time or an invitation to um, talk to people in kind of authority or in public bodies. And it's really important that they were afforded that time and that space. But actually what's more important is that once they've listened and they've taken that on board, that actually change can be affected. So it's not just a tick box, we're gonna to listen to them exercise and off they go, we've done that. Actually, it's about what happens after they've listened to us. And they've gotta be open and flexible and kind of be invested in wanting to make those changes and listen to those communities because that's only communities can make their own communities stronger. Absolutely, absolutely. It comes from within, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's what this plan is about. It's a bottom-up plan. It's about the community taking responsibility and taking ownership and saying, you know, this is our community. We know what's best for it. Thank you. That's brilliant. So that's um, Mark and Dawn discussing the community economic development plan they've built. If you're a district councillor or county councillor with a ward and you haven't got one of those plans, then you're going to miss out on being able to spend all this money because they're great tools for drawing in the cash. I think, Mark, you've got copies of it to look at, haven't you? So there'll be some copies of that economic development plan on the front here. If you want to come and grab one and take it away, you can. And I think we're going to email out some of these notes. And if we can, I think we'll attach the plan to it so you'll get an electronic copy of that. Our fourth policy pillar is opening up local government to community-led bids to run contracts and reinvent services collectively by allowing community groups to come in from the outsides and redesign services. And we've got a video here from Jill 11 discussing just how they did that. Um, the second chap speaking in the video was a local GP. I'm not sure if we've got the right uh, uh, labels on it. So we've got Indigo from Jill 11 and the local GP talking. So we'll watch that video now. Jill 11 Hub started 21 years ago. It started off with a very family start, but now it's, it's for everyone really. So we do a whole range of activities for older people, for kids. Then of course the pandemic hit and we had to shut. And so everything we did was external then. So then we set up street volunteers to support every street in the area. And we had a phone hub, so everyone was phoning. We know that we've actually saved quite a lot of lives because of the mental health issues that people have had. I think we're just really lucky in this community that we've got GL11. We were directly supporting 10% of the community with prescriptions and shopping and mental health support. We had 5% of the community volunteering here. People were volunteering in the vaccination centre and with street volunteers and delivering food bank and just so much. It's been a real community effort. We've seen an amazing amount of community kindness. We've got a really significant mental health programme now because during the pandemic, what we found was it, with so many of the calls, people were phoning up because they were isolated and lonely and just needed someone to talk to. And then we found that people weren't just lonely, 
they were developing mental health and anxiety and depression issues during the pandemic. We then got the money from the lottery and started having some caseworkers to support people. And that then evolved into partnering with the primary care network to set up a counselling service. And so now all the GPs can refer people direct into the counselling service. Um, there's 800 referrals a year. That works with four local GP practices. I mean, there's a lot of different levels that um, community groups like G11 can help. Some, some of it is directly supporting vulnerable people with difficult lives, really, and those sort of people tend to attend GP surgeries more than other groups of people. So quite often, if you can get them engaged with GL11, either helping as volunteers or, or being sort of supported, they're less likely to come and see you as a GP. Um, so that helps us and it helps them because often their problems aren't predominantly medical in origin. They're usually um, psychosocial, which is you know, difficulty with life, uh, and GL11 is much better positioned to help with that than GP surgery. So it's a way of sort of repositioning care, if you like. We've got to encourage work between the sort of statutory sectors, and what I mean by that is sort of social work, uh, medical health care, uh, and the community uh, and volunteer sectors. Because if we don't do that, we're just missing a real big trick in the health service uh, because we can make people a lot better if we use. Uh, voluntary service. Now the way we do that I think is we try and reduce regulation because even now and we've set up a, a fantastic mental health um, counselling service with GL11 it's been so difficult because we've had to go through a number of different hurdles to satisfy various different bodies. If we can get rid of all that we can start acting much quicker and much more effectively. Obviously we need to be safe and we've built, built a very sort of rigorous uh, governance system around it but on the other hand we don't need to have all these rules around where the funding comes from and stuff so yeah if you can take down some of those rules and I realize some of them are national and you know they, they are more difficult but that should be the the route of travel I think for for all all of us in Gloucestershire take down barriers and let's get on with helping the vulnerable people in our society. We need to be able to work in an equal partnership and not try and distort ourselves to fit into the, that bureaucratic way of doing things. If all the communities could join together, my goodness, what a difference it could make to the strategies in terms of just effective delivery. It's so much more cost effective. We haven't got layers and layers of management. We haven't got layers and layers of rules to, to follow and committees to go through. We can just hit the ground running. Within a week of shutdown, we were up and running, delivering in the community, answering, I think it was three or 4,000 phone calls in in last April. We're agile, we're fast, we're responsive. In partnership we could do so much. <clears throat> so our, four, our fifth <clears throat> excuse me, and final policy is ensuring up that all levelling up bids should ring fence 10% further um, for social investment via CICs, co-ops and other social enterprise structures to ensure that as money is spent, it is spent in um, economic structures that fundamentally benefit the community first. Um, and we're going to see a video now uh, about that. Hi, I'm Will Mansell and I work here at the Grace Network. We're a social enterprise hub that has eight other social businesses as part of it. So our businesses cover a number of sectors. We've got businesses that work in education, doing sport in schools, serving school meals. We've got recycling companies that recycle furniture, clothes. We have a company that serves food, a restaurant, and a series of community cafes. It's a whole range of things. We have a bike business that services local transport needs. We try and invent businesses that have a social purpose as well as a practical economic purpose too. So we've got to try and find ways of giving a voice to those left behind in the economy. That's really important because those often left behind in the economy tend to cost the state the most money anyway. So if we want to level up our whole economy, we have to start at those who are perhaps described as the most marginalised, as A, they're the most expensive to look after when things go wrong, and B, they're the ones who have the most to gain from a levelling up agenda. Social and community enterprise is super important to levelling up because it connects the economic work we need to do, building roads, building new schools, building hospitals, with the communities that use them. If you don't connect community to what you build, you often end up with white elephants. We've all seen in the press places that were built and no one goes to, and that's nearly always because the community aren't involved in developing them. The social economy is in one sense simple to build, in another sense quite tricky to deliver. The simple part of it is you have to listen to those who are normally left behind, think of how we support them to have the economic and 
social mobility to invent their own businesses. Once you create a level playing field through training, education, investing in communities, human beings are relatively smart and are able to often start their own businesses. Once you've given people a level playing field, the market often can work to do its own magic. The problem is, if you don't give people a level playing field, people fall behind. Then you end up with deeper and deeper problems that are more and more expensive to solve. So you have to build up capacity in the community to see real economic development. The levelling up agenda is about bringing those at the bottom nearer to those at the top. We don't want to take away from the top, but we don't want people left behind. If you don't close that gap, people have worse life expectancies, much worse economic prospects, and it's not nice for them or the communities around them. So if we work at the bottom, upskill and grow that community, then we can work our way up. Community enterprise is the best way to do that. Economic failure is normally rooted in policy failure. If we don't invest money into those communities that most need it through community resilient organisations, we won't be able to solve this problem. We need politicians at all levels to start investing more locally. Specific policies that we can deliver, for example, is letting communities run their own economic development plans and using those plans to make actual tangible decisions. The way we plan for new housing estates, the way we build new roads, needs the community to first think, what do we want in our economy? and then be given the tools to deliver it, which is simply allowing the state to join in with communities, not get out of the way, not get involved, but to co-create collectively and see those economic options grow and develop constructively together. So the plan for Growth Network specifically is to keep on proving that social businesses can make a real difference to our economy. We now have 50 employees and turning over nearly a million pounds this year. We need more examples like this, but we also need more community organisations to have the time and space to think about economic change, not just social. So our job specifically is to work with those communities to see more entrepreneurialism both in the public sector and the private sector. We won't always be able to fix everyone in the economy. The economy is very big, millions, billions of pounds, but if you create real jobs for people, that changes their life. And if you do that consecutively, person after person, that changes a whole community. If we focus on the small, the big will grow out of it, but unless we get local conditions right, we'll never get national or regional conditions right either. <coughs> So there you have it, the five-point plan to save the world. Um, we're going to go back to our breakout groups. Obviously, we talked about the first two policy pillars uh, in the first breakout group. We've now got three more to discuss. Hopefully, you'll see that the five connect together. So you might end up going back over stuff you've already spoken about.